come in all shapes and sizes. In this house, like many others, there is love, joy, and connection. Bliss moments, but also conflict, misunderstandings, and pain. Broken moments. Every family has its own story. But how can this work? Join us for our sermon series, Under One Roof. Discover hope, find healing, and together, let's turn our houses into homes. Under One Roof, living in blessed and broken families. Today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's Word. So, today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved, I'm God's servant, I'm God's powerful champion, and because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Reverence the word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I want you to know that we're not the only feast in the entire galaxy. We've got many, many feasts all over the world. And I just came from one last night, so I arrived this morning from Legaspi. Once upon a time, this whole Bicol region, we had no feasts once upon a time. And then after that, there were small feasts that popped up. Feast lights that would gather in homes, that would gather in, you know, little places, cafes. And I, I did visit the, the one that was there. And last night, I want to sh show you that I, I came from, yes, this Mayon volcano, and then of course, you know, um, the, 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 the airport, etc. But then I want to show you the, the feast last night. So we had a, a, a huge gathering because the feasts from Masbate and the feasts from Naga and the feasts from all over uh, Bicol gathered, and it was, it was just amazing. And so tell somebody beside you, we're not alone. <laughs> we're we're, we're moving relentlessly, bringing God's light. You know, we're, we're called light of Jesus and we want to just bring His light. And the reason why I share that with you is because we're under one roof. Whatever feast you belong to and whatever feast you serve, we're under one roof. And we're very, very imperfect. I want you to know we've got so many warts and weaknesses and <laughs> we, we're, we're, we're only here because of Jesus. He really is the one that has brought us here together. And our, our talk is so apt. We, are, we have one father and we have many children. One of the beautiful things about Jesus is that He always described God as Father. And that is not new in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are sporadic verses that describe and liken God as Father. But what was unique about Jesus was that He almost always called God Father. In fact, when His disciples asked Him, Jesus, can you teach us to pray? He gave a prayer workshop 101. And lesson number one was God is Father. Can you tell somebody beside you, God is Father? And so today, I want to preach to you this word. Everybody say, I'm listening. I'm listening. I want to preach to you that today, in this place, in this beautiful, sacred place, this is no accident. Say amen. amen. This is this not happen by chance. This is a divine appointment. You are here for a reason. You did, just didn't come here. No, it was an invitation. And this is what God wants you to do. He wants you to receive the Father's love. Everybody say that. Receive the Father's love. I want you to hold someone's hand. If that's your wife, if that's your friend, if that's your brother, if that's your son, your daughter, your mom, I, or, 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 or if you're just a stranger, just, just tell that person, receive the Father's love. Receive the Father's love. Our gospel 
reading comes from Luke chapter 11, verse 1 and 2, and that's exactly what happened. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. And you know what happens after that. Father. Everybody say, Father. Put your hand over your chest. Everybody say, Jesus, teach me to pray to the Father. Jesus, show the face of the Father to me now, this day. And heal me through the Father's love. All the wounds that are in my life, heal me in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to talk about fatherhood. And fathers, raise your hand. You're going to be blessed. And mothers, raise your hand. You're going to be blessed. All the children in the house, you're going to be blessed. Uh, you know, I remember as growing up and, and being in the Lord and serving God, my, there, there were a number of parents who would go to my parents and they would ask what, what, what did you do? What's the, what's the code? What's the secret? What's the recipe? What, what did you do to your son that made your son this way? Um, did you feed did, what, what kind of special prayers? Did you have special prayers for your son to be? And then my, my, my mom, and I remember my mom and my dad, you know, especially my mom, she, she would say, I don't know. He, he just turned out like that, you know. But looking back in hindsight, I would say, yes, they did something right. That the reason why they were not aware of it, because that's just who they were. Are you getting what I'm saying? You know, sometimes you're not aware of what you're doing because that's who you are and that's who they were. And what, what good things and what are the right things they did? Number one was they loved me. Number two was they spent time with me. And number three was they, they just taught me about God and they brought me into their faith. We prayed the rosary every night. We went to Mass every Sunday. And, and I, I do remember as a small boy, I, I love sharing this story. You've heard this before. My dad would go home from work, and then he would look for me. And then he will say, Bo, let's jog. And, and he was not a great jogger. We had a car parked in our garage, and both of us, we will jog around the car. And then at a certain point, not too, not too long, he'd stop. And then he'll sit down, and I will sit on his lap. And he will read the newspaper. But because he was, I was with him, he would not read the front page. First, he will read the comic section. And he will read Tarzan. And he will read Beetle Bailey. And he will read Dennis the Menace, the comic strips. And then after that, I would go down so that he could read his front page. And there, that's it. That, those few moments every night being with my dad. You know, I, I remember I had very few toys growing up. I had 10. I counted. I knew their number. They were so few. I have two sons. When they were small, OMG. Compared to them, they have a department store of toys in the room when they were, when they were small. Blame that on our wonderful friends who spoiled them to death, giving them so much toys. I had 10. I did not complain. Why? Every Saturday, my father would say, let's walk. And it would be father and son time. And I remember we would go to Cobao, not ride a jeepney, not ride a car. We would walk to Cobao. And then on the sidewalk, he would buy me a hot dog on a stick. And then we would eat. I would eat. He would not. He would just watch me. And then after that, we'd go to a department store. He'll bring me to the toy section. And then he will tell me, Bo, play. <laughs> I owned all the toys in the world. And so for about, I don't know how long I'd be playing. I'd be sitting on the floor. I'd be playing. And the sales lady they will be there watching me, tapping her foot. And then after about some time, my dad will say, okay, let's go home. And so I would go home. Again, I would not feel bad not bringing a toy. We would not buy a thing. And I would not complain. Why? My hands were not empty. I would be going home holding the hand of my dad. I, I, I just knew 
somewhere, somehow, right there. He loved me. You know, I have five elder sisters, which I called evil sisters back then. I was the youngest of his only son. And, you know, my father, he had these idiosyncrasies. You know, just imagine, you know, five sisters, you know, going up to him and say, hi, dad, hi, dad, hi, dad, hi, dad. And me, the little boy, running, hi, dad, hi, dad. And my dad, you know how he responded? Never showy, never expressing his love or, no, that's who he was. He would say his favorite word, mm. hi, dad, mm. every time, mm. <laughs> That was who, I loved him. Even if he was like that, I knew that I could trust him. And you know what? That's the greatest tragedy of this world today. When fathers are not trustworthy. This, this is it. You know, according to research, according to statistics, more than one in four children live without a father at home. They've been abandoned, they've been left. This is US statistics. In the Philippines today, you think it's much better? No, it's not. According to the University of the Philippines Population Institute, 18% of children live with only their mothers. 7% are raised by other people, mostly their grandparents. Add that together, 18 plus seven, that's 25. That's one in four. Same statistics. I, I want you to know that the problem of fathers, the problems of fathers is the problems of the world. And it, it is a social. Let me read you some statistics. Um, children without fathers at home are 10 times more likely to abuse chemical substances. According to research, statistics, four times more likely to be raised in poverty. Two times more likely to commit suicide. Nine times more likely to drop out of high school. Nine times more likely to be sexually assaulted at home. Eleven times more likely to engage in violent behavior. Twenty times more likely to be incarcerated at some point. Seventy percent of accused rapists come from fatherless homes. Sixty percent of teenage pre pregnancies occur in fatherless homes. Very bleak numbers. And I know it's scary. But please, I want you to know, instead of being despondent, I want you to know this. Because you might be saying, Brother Bo, I come from a broken home. Brother Bo, my father left us a long time ago. Brother Bo, I don't like those statistics. I don't like it either. But please know, this statistics is about the general public. It's about the general public. It did not pall people and families and children who turn their lives over to Jesus. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Because something happens when you start following Jesus in your life. And I know it is a father wound. It is, and it is real. But let me read to you this passage. And I, I pray that the, po the power of God will bless you and empower you. That anyone who is in Christ, you know what it says? The old has come. The old has gone and the new has come. You are a new creation. And I can tell you one friend after another friend who comes from a broken home, whose father abandoned them. But look at them today. They're wonderful parents. They're successful entrepreneurs. They're great missionaries. You know some of them because they serve at the feast and they lead us at the feast and they preach to you. God can transform your father wounds and heal it. Am I speaking to somebody in this place? and can transform you, and to empower you, and to be a blessing to the world. But I want you to also know that fathers, bad fathers, they're, a, they're, not, they're not a new problem. You find them in the Bible. In fact, in the Bible, some of the heroes of the Bible were bad fathers. Just to tell you that that's the situation, and that's reality. Abraham left deserted his son Ishmael in the desert. What kind of father will do that? He deserted him to die. King David, great king, right? Bad father. 
most likely running the kingdom complicated his life. But not only that, he complicated his own family life. Ask me how. Louder. Eight wives. Uh, we know of King Solomon, you know, 700 wives, 300 concubines, um, and, and that's all we know. But it, ha it, it came from the father of King Solomon, King David. Do you know that in, in the law of Moses, that was not allowed, that was prohibited, that was against the law of God, and yet here was King David having eight wives and, and a few other women uh, not mentioned, other, other wives and other concubines. And, and eight wives. You know, when, I'm, when I meet a man and I find out that he's having an affair, he has a second woman, I have a temptation. I want to go up to him and I want to tell him, you know, dude, you know, bro, I have one woman. And it's very complicated already. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it that you want another one. I am married to the most amazing, the best wife you can ever think of. But it's still complicated. And here is King David with eight. You know, his, his family was a disaster. Disaster if you read the Bible. His eldest son, Ammon, raped his half-sister, Tamar. His other son, Absalom, killed his brother, Ammon. And Absalom and another brother, Adonijah, on separate occasions, carried out a coup d'etat and grabbed the throne, wanted to grab the throne of their father, King David. Horrible family. But those are the good guys. I'm talking of Abraham and I'm talking of King David. Wait until you hear the bad guys in the Bible and how horrible they were as fathers. I'll give you two examples. King Manasseh and King Ahas. Pangalan pa lang eh. You know what they did? Ask me what. They worshipped idols. They worshipped this god. His name is Molech. And they would get their children and throw their children in a fiery furnace to their God. Yes. Kill them. Burn them to a crisp. Why? Because they were asking requests from their idol, hoping that their idol will listen to their prayer because they are sacrificing their children. I want you to know in an eerie parallel, it still happens today. Except that parents are no longer sacrificing their children to an idol, Molech, but to the idol of success. And for the sake of grabbing their dreams, they're giving up their kids. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Uh, David Blankenhorn wrote a book, Fatherless America, confronting our most urgent social problem. That's what he, he wrote in his book. And this is what he says. A growing number of American children have no relationship with their fathers. When you can't or don't trust the first important man in your life, trusting others later on, especially those in authority, becomes harder and less likely to occur. You know, when, I, when, I come, when, when somebody comes up to me and I, I get to know his life, and, and, he, and he says that he has a problem dealing with the boss in the office and the leader in the prayer group and the teacher in school and the president of the homeowners association, whatever. You know, if he has problems with any authority, most likely I will find out that he has a toxic relationship with his own father. And get this, it sometimes translates into his relationship with his God. The reason why he has a push and pull, difficult relationship with a God called father is because he has a problem with it. Am I speaking to somebody here? Are you getting my drift? Are you getting my point? The heart of every child cries out, Papa, can I trust you? 
And if that father, if that papa is not trustworthy, that person growing up will have a difficult time. Why? Ask me why. Because parents, and I've said this before many, many times in previous talks, you are, parents, raise your hand. Raise your hands, parents. You are the first picture of God that your children will have. You are. And, but this also includes uncles and aunts and kuyas and ates and teachers and leaders. And tragically, some kids have a difficult time getting a, 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 no, going to, you know, getting to know God because they get a distorted picture. Everybody say distorted. A distorted picture of who God is. And I know this is bad news, but, but let me share with you. There is a path to healing. There is a way out. There is a way to heal your father wounds. Ask me how. You've got to insist because this, this is big. If you agree with me that there is a problem with fathers in this world, how many of you agree generally? I'm, I'm not talking about your father, but I'm talking about fathers in general. That there is a problem in this world. Raise your hand. There is a problem, right? And, and, and I'm telling you now, this is not just a, a problem of fatherhood, but this is the foundation of many of the problems of the world. The reason why we've got so many problems in the world, as much as why there's problem in politics, why there's problem with wars, why there's problem with corrupt people in business and so on, it is because of the problem of fatherhood. Fathers are not acting as good fathers. Now, I'm telling you there is a healing that can happen. There is a solution to this problem. What is it? Ask me what? You've got to insist. Are you, do, you, do you really want to know? Brother Audie, you can take over. Just, these people don't want to know. Do you want to know the solution? It, it really is. It's the only way. It's called reparenting. That's the only way. That's the only path to healing. And there are two, two ways of reparenting. The first one is you've got to be reparented by other humans who show you the face of God's love. Other humans. Other humans. And this is the high call of all friendships. If you have a friendship, the high call is to mirror God's love to that friend. This is the high call of all spiritual families, like the feast. The feast is not just an event. The feast is not just worship and songs and talk and go home. No, the feast is the reason why I am who I am. Is because for 40 plus years, I was involved in the feast where I had friendships. Everybody say friendships. That healed me. I want you to know my parents, as wonderful as they are, they were imperfect. And yes, I grew up with this wound and that wound and this wound and that wound. But I was healed because there were humans, their friends. The feast is very, 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 very times one million. Very imperfect. Yes or no? And yet, and yet I say this, there are enough humans in the feast who somewhere, somehow struggle to show God's love to the people in the feast. There are enough. There are enough. And I'm telling you, we are healing the world. We are healing people. There are enough. And I'm telling you, please, please, now that you're attending the feast, get into our small groups. Get into our small groups and find out what these humans are. The second way of reparenting is going to the father himself and to ask the father, Father, I've got some father wounds from my human father. Can you, my heavenly father, reparent me? And you've got to go to Jesus because you've got to allow Jesus because he who is the perfect image of the father will introduce to you who the father is. Because Jesus said in John 14, verse 7, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And the most amazing thing, brothers and sisters, I have been reading the Bible for 40 plus years. There is one part of that scripture 
that Jesus describes his father, I believe, in the best way. In the best, best, best way. Do you want to know what that part of the Bible is? That you get to know the heart of the Father like no other. It is the story of the prodigal son. And we're going to unpack that today as we bring this message at half point. I want you to know that maybe a part of you, when at the moment I say the prodigal son, you zone out. Because we're going to read that again, Brother Bo. Uh, I've read that a hundred times. <laughs> can, can we read something else? You know what? The Bible was designed to be read a hundred times, a thousand times, and a million times. Because it is meditation literature. It was written as meditation literature. Meaning to say, you do, when, every time you read the Bible, everybody say, I'm listening. Every time you read the Bible, it is not, you don't just learn something new. You love someone old. <laughs> it is a love affair. And so Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 13, Jesus says, There was once a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Can you read for me that line? Father... Give me a share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Between them, Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off in a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. My friends, modern people like you and me, we read that passage, you say, huh, yeah. If you were in the room when Jesus said this story, you would be appalled to death. You would like, what? You would be you would feel the plot so offensive. Ask me why. Because in their culture, if a son asks for his inheritance while his father was still alive, he was saying, Father, you're already dead to me. I value your property more than you. That's what the youngest son was saying. Really, really bad. And you know what? This is what happens. Next slide. I want to share with you three messages from this prodigal son story. Here's the first one. You choose your fate. Everybody say that. Because this father in the prodigal son story is very strange. Because here's the youngest son, and he says, Hey, Dad, inheritance, can you give it to me now? You know, I was really waiting for the, for the father to act like, Dolphy in John and Marsha. I just lost 90% of the audience. <laughs> you know, I, I really, really was half expecting the father, you know, the, the, fa the son says, Tai, mana ko? Sige na, bigay mo na sa akin. I, I feel just, I mean, in my imagination, ah, mana mo, ah. Oh, mandali lang yan. Lapit ka. Lapit pa. Lapit pa. Yun lang pala eh. Mana mo eh. And then the father will get his slippers. Mana mo. Ito mana mo. Buisit ka. You know, I, I, I was half expecting. But you see, the father in the story says, yes. He gives it. I find that scary. But that's exactly what God is doing to us. He gives us, this is, this is the terrifying truth of free will. We have the ability to follow God at every moment, but at every single moment at that same time, we also have the ability to say no and reject God. Isn't that terrifying? You're not. You, you can Right now, you can be the most amazing saint or you could be a Hitler. Right now, this moment, it's your choice. And God gives it up to you. Friends, be careful with what you wish for. I want you to hold someone's hand if you can. Grip, grip that person hard. Break a few bones. And then tell that person, be careful what you wish for. You know why? Even if you're asking for the wrong thing, because you think it's the right thing, you'll receive it. 
the, <laughs> that's scary. The prodigal story, the prodigal son story is the Genesis story 2.0. Jesus and his mind was so marinated in, John, in, in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that, that, that it leaked to his stories. And you see the, the prodigal son, the, the, the youngest son, saying, inheritance mine, inherit, father's inheritance, give it to me. Without the father was Adam and Eve asking for God-likeness without God. And then the prodigal son taking that inheritance away from the father's house is Adam and Eve walking away from the Garden of Eden. You got what I'm saying? And friends, you at any single moment can choose to follow God or follow your spiritual arrogance in every decision. Am I preaching to somebody in this house? Are you receiving this in your spirit? Is God speaking to you right now? At every single moment, God says, you choose your faith. You choose your fate. It is scary. He will allow the bad consequences of your bad decisions to happen to you. And so, my dear friends, at every single moment, you cry out to God and you say, God, please help me. I want to follow you. I want to do your will. I, I will be careful in asking what I want because you might just give it. Message number two, sin makes us act like animals. In Luke chapter 15, it continues, after he spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen in that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. You know this part of the story, right? He longed to fill his stomach with the pods of the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. You, we, we know that he was in a place, um, he, he could not eat pigs. He's a Jew. He could not eat pigs. So what he could do was eat the food of the pigs. In other words, he became a pig. And so this was the parable telling us that when you sin against God, when you rebel against God, you begin to act like animals. When you, we are ruled by selfishness and greed and lust and pride, we do disgusting things. Say amen. amen. We do. We do disgusting things with our life. We do disgusting things with our family. We do disgusting things with the world. The reason why there's all, there are all sorts of atrocities because we act in rebellion against God. Here's message number three. The parable is about the Father's love. One more time. Everybody say, receive the Father's love. When he came to his senses... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he's thinking about that and he said, I'm going to go back. And he did go back. I want you to know that Adam and Eve, they were expelled from the Garden of Eden. Yes or no? Yes? Okay, question. If you know your Genesis, were they able to come back? Were they able to return? Were they able to go back to the Father, to God? And the answer is no. Jesus in this parable was saying they could have come back. They should have come back if they only acted like the son who decided, I've made a mistake. I'm going back and I'm going to ask the Father's forgiveness. Am I the only one being excited here with Scripture? Oh my gosh, the Bible is amazing. It is Jesus who's saying, Sinayang nila. They could have returned. And my friend, I'm speaking to everybody here who feels like you're that youngest son. And maybe you have made a few mistakes. And you're wondering if you are not worthy anymore. I'm telling you, just come back. Let God take care of you. And let His mercy bring you back. Luke 15, 20 says, So he got up and he went to his father. He prepared ng script. And he was going to say his speech. But he could not say the speech. Because the father, this is what he did. While he was still a long way off, 
His father saw him and is filled with his compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. My dear friends, this is the vision that I'm, I'm sharing you. That father was every day looking out of the window, waiting for his son to return. And this is the picture that Jesus wants. You know, in, in the story, Jesus was introducing his dad. He's saying, this is your dad. This is your God. This is your father. He's looking out the window, looking at the horizon. When is my son coming back? When is my son coming back? He's waiting for you. And my dear friend, he runs. That's what the Bible says. That's what Jesus says. The father ran. I want you to know that in their culture, an adult Man does not run. Ask me why. Because, you know, they, they, they wore those funny clothes. And, and for a father to run, he has to lift up his robe and his tunic. And then he runs. And you bare your legs. If he does not do that, he's going to trip. He's got to raise. And you bare your legs. And in their culture, you don't bare your legs. If you're an adult man, that's shameful. But this father did not mind that, did not think of that because he was running to the father. I'm sorry, he was running to his son. He was the father. And so today, I invite you, this beautiful moment, because when Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray, he said, when you pray, say, let's read together, Father, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. In the other versions of the other, of the gospels, you've got the more complete Our Father. We just chose this because this is, I want to bring this truth to you. Today, this moment, this is not just an event. This is a healing moment. This is not just a gathering. This is reparenting time. Will you allow the Father to reparent you and heal your father wounds? Heal your mother wounds. Heal your Lola wounds. Heal your Lola wounds. Heal the wounds of our heart caused by your ancestors. Will you allow your Father and friends, whether you had a good relationship with your parents or whether you had not a so good relationship with your parents, this is Jesus' advice to you. As we worship today, cry out, Father. That's his advice. You've got wounds? Here's my advice. Cry out, Father. Spend time with him so you get to know the real Father. And then get to know that the Father is a provider, a forgiver, and a defender. Jesus said, You're, this is what's going to happen. He's going to give you daily bread. This is what's going to happen. When you go, get to know my Father, He's going to forgive you of all your sins. This is who the Father is. He's going to defend you. And so let the Father surprise you today. Are you ready? And then when you get healed by the Father, to all the fathers here and all the mothers here, you will become better fathers and better mothers when you get to know the Father. And maybe your marriage is non-existent anymore. You've separated. If you have, please still father your children. Please be a, be a, be a presence of love in their lives and speak to them that even if you've made mistakes, many, many times, tell them. Tell them that you are following God and you're asking God to make you a better father, to make you a better mother. And so today, see the father running towards you. See the father's tears of joy see him embrace you today are you are you like that prodigal son walking back to the father right this moment 
receive the Father's love. trust and my full love and I believe you will bless me more so I can give more in Jesus name Amen It is so beautiful to be in the presence of God. And can we pray right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? I want you just to lift up to him all your needs, whatever you're going through. He knows what you're going through. He knows where you're coming from. He knows the burdens of your heart. Just just bring it up to God and say, Lord, I surrender everything that all hurt and all pain and all worries and all fear. Lift them all up to you, Lord. I surrender them to you. You are my king and you are the center of my life. And I trust you and I know that you are blessing me right now. I receive your love. I receive your joy. I receive your peace. I receive your healing. I receive your provision in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Live a fantastic life.